so thank you for for taking time out of, of Monday to to have a chat with me. Um, I caught the Promised Land a few weeks back. I thought it was I thought it was a great film. Um, it's you know it's very dark. You know it's I'm not necessarily normally one for kind of like a a western sort of story, but you know it's very it's very dark. It's very bleak in a, in a way. It's very it's very me. Uh, so. So thank you, thank you for the film. Um, I guess um, we should probably start, you know, at the beginning. You know, what was it about this story that that spoke to you? Because it is based in, to some extent, on on real life. It is. It's based on real life, but also there's uh, the novelist uh, Ida Yesen wrote sort of like a fictionalized version of the real events, and it was really her novel that attracted me to the story. So I have to give credit for that. I didn't know about the story at all, and I just fell in love with the story, which is so incredible a journey, but also the characters, every single character I thought was fleshed out, interesting. Uh, and and I was just, I was also very happy to finally find a part to work with Mats again. You know, that was a perfect part for him. So there's a lot of little things that sort of uh, came together. And this isn't your first time adapting a work of fiction. You know, do you have a particular method when you're working in this way? I usually tend to uh, be quite brutal with the material uh, and not really care whether this or that thing, you know, happens exactly the same way. But what I always am very careful about is trying to retain the spirit and soul and heart of the thing. So uh, and the characters. I think if 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 you if somebody's read a book and can recognize the characters as being the ones from the book. It doesn't matter whether a specific thing happens this way or that way, or a little later, or maybe not at all. I just think people are happy to be in the company of these people that they fell in love with when they read the book. And that's how I feel, and that's what I try to, to also do. You know, you mentioned you working with Mads again. I think most actors kind of get pigeonholed as either hero or or villain. And I think to a lot of audiences, he's potentially better known as a villain, having played, you know, Hannibal and he was in Casino Royale against James Bond. But here he's the hero. What do you think it is about him as an actor that means that he can sort of switch sides so so effectively? I think he can do anything, Mass, really. I think he he's able to play anything. I think the reason why he's getting uh, villain parts, you know, in America, his own answer is always the accent that is the accent it's hard to play a, a you know a, a hero with our danish sort of like clipped weird monotonous accent uh, so i think that's the main reason he certainly has a hero face if you ask me um so in denmark he tends to get the more hero type parts oh hero you know really the main character promised that is not a hero per se right he's not a always a very nice guy but he's not a he's not a villain you know, at least. Yeah. And what was it like collaborating with them again? I mean, I'm guessing by now you kind of got quite a nice shorthand together. So there's not too much, you know, much we, back and forth with each other. We did. Yeah. It was like, uh, it was, it was, uh, it was like riding a bike. You know, you, you maybe even if, if it's been half a year when you get back on it, it's, it's easy. We, we had a really great time doing a royal affair together. So, and we stayed friends. So we've seen each other quite a lot since then. And so it was easy to uh, get back. It was we were actually quite happy to be working together again. And we're already now talking about what's the next project. So that that could be, we just have to figure it out. Nice. And one of the things that I really liked about this film is that it had two really strong female female characters. Um, you know, they're kind of very much the the equal of Ludwig in a way. They've got their own autonomy they've got their own storyline they've got their their own arcs how important was it for you to give these women this platform to to tell their stories oh it was extremely important because otherwise i think this film would have been slightly old-fashioned if you know what i mean if it's just about a man goes out and tries to conquer the land you know and i thought that that's why i love the novel so much because uh specifically especially the character of Anne barbara um uh, the housekeeper I, I felt that she kind of in the book and in the film, she grows and grows almost into the main character. And of course, she's also the one who has a very satisfying ending, I would say, in terms of, you know, the what happens. Uh, I, I, I think I think that was part of why I really wanted to do this. It, it, I, I thought it was a modern take on a pioneer story. And it wasn't just about the guys, 
And that's what interested me. And it's a very sort of modern family unit as well that's, that's in this film sure. as well. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's the heart of it, right? That's the whole theme. I mean, it is a it is a period piece. Um, how do you set about making something in a different time? You know, are you, you know, you how do you go about trying to be authentic to the time, but also make it appeal to a modern audience? Because I imagine that's quite a tricky balance to get right. Right. I think I think that the modern part is how you write it. I think just like in most uh, British uh, period films, they don't bother with. The language right the language is quite modern and we do that as well in denmark the language is modern it, the, the characters are sort of fresh and somewhat modern thinking as much as you can allow them to be but the rest of it has to be right i think you know the the surroundings the you can't have a telephone pole you can't have a an iphone and, but also the, the costumes i i just i i surround myself with really talented people like the costume designer, the production designer, uh, the makeup artist, the the people who do the hair. Everybody's very talented, and everybody's very on top of their game in terms of like making sure that it's that it's right. It doesn't have to be a hundred percent right, but it has to be. It can't be wrong, right? So that's it. Can't be something where people go that that's not seventeen fifties, you know. So at least so that's that's the trick. Really, just hire great people to help you do it. I think you, I'm right in saying that, you know, this was shot across several different countries. I mean, what was that shoot schedule like? Yeah, it was a little insane. I wouldn't recommend shooting in three different countries because because every time you sort of like find yourself, okay, now we have a groove, then you have to pick up your stuff and leave and go to a new country. We actually work with three different crews. So that's a little tough because you have to get to know everybody from the beginning. And that was a little, yeah. I think two countries is enough, <laughs> or one, one even better. <laughs> and so obviously, you've had you've had, you know very successful career, you know, on both sort of, on both sides of, of the uh, the Atlantic. You know, what what of your you know your projects in the past are you particularly proud of? Which ones are you do you sort of look at back on most fondly? I would say, in terms of my writing career, it would probably be the adaptation of Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, which is which was a really fun script to write, and 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 I love that movie, uh, the original one. Uh, and then in terms of films, I think Promised Land is my favorite film. I think you know that's I think it's the best film I've done. But I really Royal Affair is also a film that I I'll watch. You know, I it's it's rare that I watch my own films, but I, I can happily watch a Royal Affair and be happy with the work that I did. So, you know, you mentioned, you know, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. That's quite a heavy book and subject matter to adapt. So that must have been, you know, how do you, you know, sort of like decompress at the end of a day of, you know, working on something like that? I think, I think, you know, honestly, the way, have you read the book? The way the yeah. book is written is almost like a comic book. It's not really, it's not really psychologically very dark. It's, it is brutal, but it's also a little bit, she's a, she's a superhero. I always saw... The character of Lisbeth Salander is a kind of a modern day superhero. So I didn't feel I didn't feel the need to decompress because it was almost like writing a film where there is a superhero <laughs> in the film. And that's Lisbeth Salander. And she can do anything. She can hack, she can fight, she's cool, she knows everything, she can solve mysteries. <laughs> so it, it felt like trying to make just a realistic version of a modern day female superhero. That was really interesting. So it was actually quite a fun script to write. Yeah, it is. It's quite, yeah, it's a quite interesting way to look at the character that you say, because she is, you know, she's kind of, she is taking on the bad guys, isn't she? She is. Oh, yeah. She kicks ass. <laughs> Definitely. And as I've mentioned in, in my introduction, this is, the Promised Land is kind of a, almost like a European Western in a way. Mm. Were there any, um, were there any films that you sort of look to for, for influence or inspiration? We didn't so much look at westerns uh, as as we looked at. Um, we were very much into sort of uh, watching the old David Lean movies like Lawrence of Arabia, uh, Doctor Zhivago. We were sort of looking specifically at at sort of the epic movies from the fifties and sixties. You know, there was a big thing going on in Hollywood. There was a lot of these epics, and we kind of were trying to look at those. And then in terms of modern day, of course, there's there's you know you can pick and choose this. Uh, you know, uh, 
uh, Jane Campion's Power of the Dog, there's, There Will Be Blood. There's a lot of sort of modern day pioneer kind of films. And we also looked at those. Uh, but really what inspired us most was those old David Lean movies, actually. So do you think that maybe there is kind of a, a sway back to these sorts of films? Do you think filmmakers are looking to kind of make these sort of stories again? I think that I think that a lot of filmmakers really want to, uh, but then it's a question of can you can you get the budget, you know, and is there a willingness to finance them? I think I was very fortunate that I got this financed. Of course, it's not a huge budget film because it's a Danish film, and I don't think I could. I would I would never have been able to do this film in in America or, or Britain for that matter. I think it would have been way too expensive. And the reason why we can still do them in Denmark is because you can still keep the budget kind of down. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping that that it, they'll come back. It, it, they came back a little bit when after Gladiator, I think, right? But I, I don't know. Let's see what happens when Gladiator 2 comes out. Maybe they'll come back again. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And, and like, you know, you, you know, you worked on a, you know, a big budget production with, with The Dark Tower. How was it then sort of like recalibrating and going back to something which was a much more modest budget? Oh, I was, it did feel more modest. It actually felt as big to do this film as The Dark Tower. The Dark Tower was not a very pleasurable experience for me for so many reasons. But the main reason is that working in the studio system, as a director, you're not really, you don't have, you, it's not your vision. It's it's a kind of corporate, like it's a boardroom, you know, second guessing what does the audience want. It's not really fun to make that kind of films. So it was more an emotional Emotionally, coming back to Denmark was just great. It was great to be uh, back, you know, doing the films that I love to do and not having to answer to a lot of, uh, you know, worried <laughs> studio people. Um, so that was fun. And I think I'll stay here. You know, I think that 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 was it for me in terms of the American films. But I, I, I might do I might do European films, you know, um, but um, but certainly it was just a great to be back. It didn't feel modest. It felt quite big to do this film. It felt quite, it was quite a tough shoot. <laughs> and I guess, sort of, you know, sort of like my, my final question would be, why do you hope that the audiences take a chance on this film? Why should people go out and, and spend time watching The Promised Land? Honestly, I think that uh, judging from the reactions of the audiences I have watched it with, people always say that they cry, they laugh, you know, they, they, they you know, they get emotionally connected to the characters they fall in love with some of them and i think that's for me is always a good reason to go to see a film i always whenever i see a film where i can laugh a little bit and maybe shed a tear i'm happy that's all i need and then and and be sort of a, hopefully surprised by the journey that you did stuff you didn't see coming and uh yes it is bleak but as you know having watched it it also has funny moments it also has all the so i think i i, 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 I it is a it is a realistic film, but I, I would also say we shot it as a little bit of an adventure, if you know what I mean. It was kind of a big epic. That's always fun to watch in the theatres. Definitely. Well, I wish you the best of luck with the release. Thank you.